Civil society assess Boyega Oyetola's achievements ahead of the Oshun state's governorship elections. And will expose you, says the PDP, as they give former President Lucia Gwambasanjo 48 hours to clarify remarks on Atiku. For this is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anna Kong. Intense grassroots campaign by political parties and candidates, allegations and counter-allegations, as well as party inter-party defections, have characterized the build-up to the July 16 governorship elections in Oshun State. Now, the incumbent APC Governor Buiga Oyitala is eligible for re-election and has been re-nominated by his party. Nonetheless, supporters say the election is likely going to be a contest between the incumbent governor, Boyega Oyetola, and uh, who's the candidate of the APC, by the way, and the PDP's Senator Adimola Adiriki. Now, in his address uh, at the various campaign venues across the state, Governor Oyetola constantly reiterated his message that he had no money to give voters before, during, or after the elections as a form of inducement. He has also assured the people of good governance that will impact positively on the lives of Oshun residents. The governor expressed joy at the reception he got from his supporters, saying it's heightened his hope of victory come July 16 governorship elections in the state. Well, joining us to discuss his achievements and more is uh, the... Mr. Olufemi Lawson, he's a, a pro-democracy activist, he is the media entrepreneur, and he's also the national auditor of Campaign for Democracy. That's a, a very big profile. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, first things first, we are looking at the um, progress that the governor of Austrian State has made since he took over from uh, the now minister of Arag Bashala. Um, and we have seen a lot of... Um, a chain of events that have happened building up to this election, whether it be insecurity, whether it be allegations, defections, like I said at the beginning of the conversation. But let's look at the man himself. He took over in 2018 and had, had a lot of eyes on him. How can you assess um, his um, achievements so far? Do you think that he's done well? Let's start by looking at changing the tide from Iraul Fareg Bashala government to an Oyetola government, what have, has been the most significant change that has taken place? Well, the most fundamental change from my physical assessment and close interaction with not only Ocean State's political space, but the people, you know, having had, you know, lived there, our families there, our businesses there, and of course, having been actively involved in pro-democracy activities in the state, even before the former Governor Rebeshola era, suggest that uh, Governor Yitola today is one of the most underreported governors when you, think about, when you talk about governance over the last couple of years in Nigeria. In actual fact, a lot of people, particularly those who are keenly involved in what was the situation in Oshun State before he came in 2018, and now will agree with me that this is a governor who was not, you know, which, which, which is not like the typical Nigerian politician that blows trans, trumpets about how much more they have been able to deliver on, the, on their mandates and, of course, their promises to the electorate. Between what he inherited, just like you said, and now, there are fundamental differences like. which may not be in tandem with the usual political aspiration of politicians. Explain it. I'd like but to understand what the you aspiration mean. of the people. Hmm. You know, the our administration of Governor Rebbe Shola, as you know, radical as it was in coming to the position of Sur State, was such that had so much conflict of interest with the people of Ocean State. Rebbe Shola came with a lot of visions, came with a lot of programs, but some of these programs were executed out of the aspiration of the people. So, no matter how beautiful they were, it was always a conflict you know, with the people, you know, with the civil servant, with the political class, and some of that. But one thing Governor Itala was able to do from the beginning was to return governance to the people. 
and to begin to execute government policies and programs in line with the demands of the people. Mm. If Let me give you an example. When Governor Robert Shula came, he embarked on a school reform program, you know, harmonization of school uniforms, school curricula, and some other things. This you know, pitched the governor against the people for almost eight years that was governor of Washington State. But when Governor Yetola came, he didn't just bring out policies for education in Washington State. He went back to the people, constituted committees, had interactions with people across the state. What do you really want? How should we really run the educational system? Broad professionals, so broad You're saying that the former so governor was not connecting with the people? A lot, as beautiful as his programs were supposed to be. So this governor returned you know, the culture of asking the people what, and that is why today the school reform program in Osho State has enjoyed the acceptability of the Osho State people. Schools now wear their own uniform or like the, you know, the singular uniform pro program of the Irishian administration. That is just an instance. And if you look at the way this government is executing this project, having been part of the groups of civil society that visited Osho recently, you realize that most of the communities visited Projects are being executed on the basis of the need of the people. Yeah. It is good to have beautiful ideas. You may think it is enough for us to build flyover in this community. And for the people, it's about having portable water yeah. or basic health centers. So that flyover will make no meaning because it does not conform with their need. What the hotel administration has been doing from our interaction with the people is to meet with the people, meet with the communities, and assess their need. In line even with the need assessment program, of the federal government mm -hmm. and you know, bring projects and programs. And that is why today, Osho State, as we speak, have the highest number of working primary health care centers. I've been to the Census State of Nigeria by the virtue of my you know, work, and I can say that Osho was the state where between one ward and the other, you find work, not just health centers that are built for the purpose of having buildings, working health centers with personnel, with you know, with facilities, with, you know, drugs and every other thing required to call this, you know, basic And these health centers, centers were built by Governor Yeshola? Over 300 as we speak. Or his predecessor. Over 300 in the last three years have been built by the incumbent administration. Interesting. And yes. if I were to go there on a fact-finding mission and to, there, to be certain that these... There, there are visuals. Because, I ask this because several governors in different states have built state-of-the-art health centers. And six months down the line, those health centers yeah, are not working. Can a governor yet go walk into any of those health centers and get treatment as opposed to flying outside of the country? Because it's one thing to say you've built a nice health care center for the people, but it's not something that you can use. So what, what, what is the quality? What, what, has, been, what has been the situation you know, that you have just referred to is that one governor just sits you know, in the comfort of his living room and assume that we need to build you know, a multi-billion health facility in the state capital or wherever, maybe in his village, in the name of the state. And mostly, these are usually tertiary and secondary health institutions. But if you look at the basic health care need of the people, you speak from the ordinary man who had malaria, the woman who is undergoing antenata, who does not actually need to go to the general hospital. Because even before these big hospitals came, there are these traditional birth attendants, there are nurses, you know, traditional medical practitioners in the neighborhood who treat these basic health issues. So what he did is not to build gigantic health infrastructures. Even though the state institution is building a tertiary you know, health you know, facility. But it is about the fact that I don't need to go to the general hospital to treat malaria, to treat headache. It is about bringing health care delivery to the people. So it is sustainable because you don't need to bring you know, a scanner, you don't need to bring you know, all sort of big equipment and machines to a basic health center. It has to do with the fact that I don't need to travel for, from Iboko or, you know, or my village to Oshobu you know, to get health care, the tertiary institution. Mm -hmm. So he has been able to take health care delivery closer to the people that you may not need to go and register your wife at the state general hospital because he has to go through Naimo and Inata. So these are the things that these basic, you know, the primary health care facilities are taken care of. Mm -hmm. So it is not about the fact that on, when there are issues that requires surgery, you know, and some other critical health issues, they are transferred to the secondary and tertiary inst health institutions that are managed by the state, you know, and of course in the state there are also federal health care institutions. But the primary need of the people has been the focus of the government from our assessment. Let's talk about... Um, 
you know, making the state viable, the viability of the state economically, business-wise, how many um, business opportunities have been created under his administration, what's the ease of doing business status of the state, especially the city, the big city, um, what kinds of investments has he attracted? One of the fundamental ingredients required to actually attract investors into any society is the safety and security of investment, which has been the one of the major reasons why people don't actually you know, come to you to invest in your community, in your state or your society. Today, the state is rated as one of the most peaceful in the country because of the commitment of his administration to the security of properties and lives in the state. You know, this is one of the states least expected, even from some of us as Yoruba people, to implement the Amotec on the Southwest Security Network. It's one of the states where the network is effectively working today, and you realize how much more the state has also been able to do in empowering the police and other security agencies. And so the state now has enjoyed peace. It has attracted you know, a lot of economic activities. For people who have visited Oshobo some 15, 10 years ago, you will know that it is no longer the same state today. All banks have their branches in the state. Investors are beginning to come. You know, to invest not only in the mining activities, in other socio-economic activities. And it has improved from our interaction, even with the citizens and state actors, the internally generated revenue of the state. And that can only happen in an atmosphere where there is peace and stability, just like we saw. Let's go, let's just talk more about the security aspect. We also, there was a very big incident in the state at a time where all eyes were on Oshun State. Um, and you did speak about the fact that Amotekon seems to be very active um, and they have collaborated with the police. Um, if Amotekon has been that active, um, why did we have that kind of incident? I mean, I remember in Ogun State when it first started with the so-called unknown gunmen and the issues of herders and the ban on open grazing. Um, has that also been implemented in Oshun State in terms of grazing? Because we saw other states saying, uh, they would stay action, there would not be a ban on open grazing. But how protected are the farmers? How protected are the people of Oshun State, especially with what happened uh, recently? What, what happened recently happened in Ondo State, mm -hmm. the Owo incident. No, um, not the Owo incident, there was, there was another... Sh a clash. Yes. Yeah. What, you see, if you look at the security situation, particularly in the Southwest, and if you want to you know, make an analysis of the farmer, Eda's conflict, or you know, Eda's invasion of farms or mm -hmm. attacks, on villages, you, if you rate it comparatively, you realize that Oshun is one of those states where, just like Lagos, where, have been, where there have been few or no incidences of f clashes within elders and farmers or attacks on villagers. If you, today, there's hardly a week that you don't hear reports you know, from parts of Ondo State, Ekiti State, where you know, communities are being invaded by these earth militias and some you know, criminal elements. We also masquerade as elders, you know, across the communities. But today you can really find in the news, this is a news organization, where there are issues or where there are clashes between elders and farmers. Mm -hmm. What Amoteco has we had interactions even with the Amoteco Corps in Oshuste with the Director General. And at the point of our interaction, we even had, you know, we were, we, we were opportune to witness a scenario where a particular leader of the Eight men around Okela put a call across to the director general of the Amotekun Corps reporting an incidence of cattle rustling. Then you can begin to analyze the level of trust that has been built in the Amotekun in Oshun State. The leader of the headers called the DJ of the Amotekun Corps reporting you know, an incident of some cattle rustlers who came from Ekiti to rustle cattle from Okela to Ekiti State and were caught. So he was asking the, you know, the DG should. You know, take over the case from the local Amoteco unit mm -hmm. that apprehended them at that you know local government of the state. So it tells you that the state has been able to you know do a lot in ensuring that not only is the security you know is the Nigerian police force you know nipping the nipping crimes at it, in its board, but that Amoteco is effectively also delivering on its mandates you know across the state and we fiscally you know experience that during our visit to our state. Let's talk about youth. The youth um, is a very important factor, even as the governor is returning uh, to that office. Um, he had spoken about the fact that the fit is not an option and that he definitely hopes to return. 
Uh, many would say that he probably is dependent on the power of incumbents. Um, but um, what has the government done to empower young people? We see that most of the crimes that are committed are yeah, committed by young, young people. people yeah. uh, even the election violences, I mean, I would not see you. I would really be embarrassed if I see you carrying a ballot box and running away. But we see that you know, young people are engaged in this. Um, how has his government impacted young people and what's the level of employability for these young people? Because Nigeria is suffering under employment mm -hmm. and, of course, um, unemployment. Um, what's being done to make sure that the average Oshun youth is engaged one way or the other, whether it's private or public? Well, it's a national issue, just like you rightly said. A lot of our competent young people are underemployed. And a lot, of course, are unemployed as we speak. And the truth is that no state or federal government has the capacity to bring into its own workforce the number of young people that are leaving schools, that are graduating, or that have gone through vocational you know, processes and needs job to be self-sustaining. But what the government has been doing from our observation, from our assessment, is the opportunities it is creating with the interventions from the federal government, with the job opportunities that are being created by you know, small and medium enterprises that are em emerging in a short state, not in the capital, but across the state. And the state also has deliberate policies, you know, through its Ministry of Youth and Sport, to engage young people. It is impressive that the governor you know, thought it wise to you know, appoint a very young person as the Commissioner for Youth and Sport in the state, Mr. Yemi Lawa, who has been effectively engaging with the young people. And there have been series of programs focused on the young people to empower them, to you know, give loans, to create What's the opportunities. Spread? That's why I asked at the beginning. What's the spread? There's always a tendency of mass migration to the center, which is but the that, capital. That, that is, that is and that's because most of these empowerment programs or whatever you do does not spread across the, the uh, state. Yes, unlike what you know, ordinary should be seen around the state capital, everybody wants to cluster around the government, the seat of government to get this benefit. This has been able to, you know, the government has been able to distribute it significantly to other parts of the state in a row. We've been to processing factories where people now engage in vocational activities of processing foods you know, through their agricultural programs. Another part of the state where People who get loan cannot do their own businesses without having anything to do even with the government in the state capital. Mm. Um, okay, let's talk about the politics of 2022. Um, July is just around the corner. In a couple of days, we will see heightened um, uh, campaigns and you know everybody's getting ready for the elections. Akiti just um, got concluded. Yes. We're still seeing lingering issues mm -hmm. about you know electoral... Uh, malpractices, etc., etc. Um, we've also seen drama happen during certain campaigns. There was a shootout um, on, from the ministers, allegedly from the ministers' uh, convoy at some point uh, during the primaries. We also see, see that there were many people in the APC that seemed not to be very happy with what's been happening. Let's talk about what's been happening in the APC in um, Oshun State. How together is the party? I saw the governor reaching out, say, begging members of the party not to be angry, but to look to the future. But how much can his, um, he, he pacify the members of the party as they get ready for the elections? It is expected that the governor, as the leader of the state, as the father of the state, will do everything possible to speak, to appeal, to, you know, to enjoin citizens you know, to support him and to bury hatchets and, of course, especially those within his political parties, so as to ensure that you know, his governance you know, continues. But the truth is that what is happening, or what is presumed to be happening in APC, is not peculiar to APC. Today, as we speak, two major political gladiators have led the PDP to contest in this election. You know, at the intro, you, you know, narrated the contest has been between the governor and the PDP's candidate. But mm -hmm. as I speak with you, the person who almost won the governorship primary of the PDP in 2018, Dr. Ake Ogumbi, is in this race as a candidate of their court party, popular candidate, an intellectual, a business magnate, you understand, who is also in the race. The former deputy speaker of the Nigeria House of Representatives is also in this race. As candidate of also one of the major political parties, the Labour Party, 
is not a pushover politician in Osho State. It's also one of those who have contested from the so PDP. What does, so what does that mean for what, the APC? What it means is that it is not the only APC in Osho State that has issues. But the truth is that politicians, whether from the factions of the PDP and the APC, have, do, you know, have the same obligation as the governor has to promote unity, to encourage those who are you know, dissatisfied to come around and ensure that the party attains victory. And that's what Governor Itola has been doing. But the ultimate decider in every election is the people. And, the you have, and you have called out several opponents of the governor who, in your words, are no mean, uh, you know, yes. ordinary politicians. Yes. So that poses a threat of sorts. It does not. It does not really pose it. Doesn't it? It does it because if you look at every election, what is the percentage of politicians or political actors we vote and determine the outcome of every election. Mm. It is usually about the, we must understand that governance, democracy is about the people. You will always have the majority of the people who are non partisan, no participating in the election. That is the reality. Nobody can tell you that it is, you know, it is the majority of a particular political party members that votes or decide who wins an election. It is usually... When the APC can come here and tell me that the governor has done so great, and then the PDP can come here and also tell me the governor has not done well. But it is not. They it is not to the ordinary people. So, so, but yeah, it is, of course, grateful that you're saying that. It's down to the people. And if the people are unhappy with Governor Yutala, definitely he will be voted out. Yes. And they will have a better choice. And there are no indications that the people are not happy with him. Especially if you I know the history expect, of the state. I don't expect you to say anything. No, no. Other you, than that. The history of Ashu State is known. There's nothing to mean about it. This was a state that was known for, you know, worker strike. That was known for protests by pensioners. We are all here, mm. some six, you know, eight years ago, where Ashu was always in the news for non-payment of worker salary, for protests by pensioners. You know, for all sort of disturbances. But today, I can actually read report even from your news medium about workers striking or should stay. These are the issues that have direct impact on the people. It's not about how politicians feel. Politicians will always be aggrieved. It is left for politicians, the governor and his party to reconcile with the politicians. But the ultimate deciders are the people and they will decide the outcome of this election. Well, we look forward to July as the elections in Oshun State come to play. Of course, uh, we have been speaking with Femi Lawson, who is, of course, a good governance advocate here to speak on the expectations for the elections come July this month. I want to say thank you for being part of the it's conversation. We will have more of these conversations as the elections draw closer. Well, we'll take a quick break, ladies and gentlemen. When we come back, we will be talking about the People's Democratic Party. A conversation between the former president, Olusha Gwon Basanjo, and the PDP, who's giving him an ulti ultimatum to clarify his recent remarks about the former vice president, Atiku Abubakar. Stay with us.